Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Hines. I'm a retired UW-Milwaukee police officer. And tonight's presentation is the 1917 Milwaukee police bombing. Prior to the September 11th terrorist attack, the single deadliest event in law enforcement history occurred in Milwaukee on November 24th, 1917, when nine officers and one citizen were killed in a bomb blast. The police were not the intended target. It's a story 100 years old that is ripped from today's headlines. Uh, it involves foreign terrorists, CSI, immigration and assimilation, the rise of socialism, the rise in white supremacist terrorism, a liberal democratic college professor, lawyer president, succeeded by a conservative Republican accused of corruption and sexual misconduct, car bombs, deaths in police custody, sexual abuse by clergy, income inequality, restrictions on immigration from countries thought to produce terrorists, impeachment of government officials, the attempted assassination of prominent Americans, the conviction of innocent people, detention of immigrants in controversial conditions, government corruption, wildfires, race riots, a global pandemic, and a man named Giuliani, also Malorganite. It's Milwaukee's oldest and largest cold case. And we will meet many interesting people, the Kennedy and uh, Roosevelt families, Mussolini, Sacco and Vanzetti, Clarence Darrow, Stephen Avery, Donald Trump, the first commissioner of baseball, Emma Goldman, J. Edgar Hoover, Princess Grace of Monaco, Yogi Berra, Leonardo DiCaprio, the birth of the ACLU, the Florentine Opera, AOC, Buster Keaton, and a movie made in Milwaukee. All of these people have something to do with this story. So let's begin. Many immigrants come to America. Between 1880 and 1920, America received more than 20 million immigrants. And beginning in the 1890s, the majority of them were from Central, Eastern, and Southern Europe. Uh, in that, by 1920, more than 4 million Italians had entered the United States. Uh, this chart shows in the gold line the tremendous increase in immigrants from that, those parts of Europe. Because things are worse in 1900s Italy than during the Roman Empire. Ancient Romans ate a very plentiful diet and they were on average five feet, six inches tall. Uh, Italians after the time of Rome had much less food to eat and they would not regain that five foot, six inch stature until after World War II. Italians are not popular due to the mafia and other crimes and because they are Catholics. Milwaukee was a diverse city. In 1908, 83% of the population had parents born abroad. And so Italians settled into Milwaukee including the Third Ward. These are the boundaries of the Third Ward. Uh, they replaced the Irish. They are the first of two waves of immigrants that come from Italy. They are fleeing famine in the 1870s. And by the 1900s, uh, they had assimilated relatively well. And many of them uh, are small uh, businessmen. And while some remain laborers, most of them consider themselves uh, as Americans. But it's a tale of two neighborhoods, the other being Bayview. The second wave of immigrants comes uh, around 1900 from other parts of Italy, and they settle in Bayview, and most of them find work in a steel mill that used to be at the southern edge of Milwaukee's harbor, and their settlement becomes known as the Italian colony. This is the location of the rolling mills. It's now roughly the south end of the Hone Bridge or roughly where the Coast Guard station is. This is the Illinois Steel Company mill. You can see uh, in the left-hand picture, uh, its location in relation to the lake and the inner harbor. And Bayview Italians are different. They are unassimilated. They speak their native tongue. Uh, they are basically just manual laborers working in a steel mill, which is very difficult. And most of what they earn in wages ends up going back to the company in rent for company housing. And this is how they feel. I came to America because I had heard the streets were paved with gold, and I found three things. One, the streets were not paved with gold. Two, the streets were not paved at all. And three, I was expected to pave them. Because income inequality is an issue then as well. In 1915, the richest 1% of Americans are roughly 18% of all income. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like anything we're dealing with today? And the rich own most of America at that time. Uh, the wealthiest 2% own uh, roughly a third of the nation's wealth, and the top 10% own roughly three quarters of it, while the bottom 40% had no wealth at all. And again, does that sound familiar? Americans' working conditions are poor. There is no federal minimum wage, no child labor laws, no health and safety laws, no unemployment compensation, workman's compensation, or social security. If you're a non-unionized manufacturing worker, you will work 60 hours a week 
to earn an average of $10. And every year, 50,000 men die of preventable industrial accidents. So some turn to socialism. The Socialist Party of America is formed in 1901. And from then to World War I, uh, they have numerous elected officials in many American cities, especially in Milwaukee, where we had sewer socialists. Uh, this group favors democratic socialism over orthodox Marxism in pursuit of honest government and efforts to improve public health by cleaning up the dirty and polluted legacy of the Industrial Revolution with new sanitation systems and other uh, public utilities. And so that means that both the Jones Island treatment plant and the Malorganite it produces are monuments to socialism. We will elect the first socialist mayor in America, Emil Seidel, in 1910, and the first socialist congressman, Victor Berger. From 1910 to 1929, uh, he will represent a district here in Milwaukee. Victor Berger is the AOC of his day. And some turn to anarchism. Anarchism basically holds that all forms of hierarchical organization, including government and religion, uh, should be done away with, and that people should uh, uh, have self-governed societies based on voluntary institutions. Their slogan says it all, no gods, no masters, against all authority. There are many types of anarchism. Uh, it does not offer a fixed body of doctrine from a single particular worldview. They can differ fundamentally. And some forms of anarchism are violent. They are known as propaganda of the deed, the late 19th and early 20th century. This includes bombings and assassinations of enemies of the people. These are designed to ignite the spirit of revolt in the people and to provoke government repression, which in turn will provoke more revolt. And one of the uh, proponents of this is Luigi Galliani. Uh, for 20 years, he is the most uh, vocal US proponent. He advocates the violent overthrow of the government through the use of direct action, bombings, and assassinations. He publishes a magazine called Cronaca Subversiva or Subversive Chronicle. This is Luigi Galliani. Other anarchists agree. During this period, anarchists will assume, assassinate uh, numerous heads of state, including the Tsar of Russia, the president of France, the empress of Austria, the kings of Italy, uh, Portugal, and Greece, and the president of the United States, William McKinley. His assassin claimed to have been influenced by the anarchist and feminist Emma Goldman. This is Emma Goldman, and we will be seeing her several times uh, in this presentation. So as a result, we pass what's called the Anarchist Exclusion Act, which, as the name implies, is designed to exclude anarchists. Uh, this is the first legislation since 1798 that called for questioning potential immigrants about their political beliefs. It bars anyone who disbelieves in or who is opposed to all organized government from emigrating to the United States. And there's an anarchist study group in Bayview. In the back room of Steve Zawick's tavern, a group of Italian immigrants have rented a back room since 1914. There are about 13 of them, and three of them may have been subscribers to Galliani's Cronaca Subversiva. This is the anarchist clubhouse uh, in Steve Zawick's tavern at the time. Uh, the insert uh, shows uh, the clubhouse in 1917 in the upper left corner. And it's still a tavern because in Milwaukee, once a tavern, always a tavern. It's now known as the Cactus Club at 2496 South Wentworth Avenue. This is the back room today, then it was the anarchist clubhouse. Enter a man named Giuliani, because every good terrorism story has to have someone named Giuliani. Augusto Giuliani was born in Italy in 1881. He's ordained a Catholic priest in 1903, and he will formally convert to Methodism in 1909. He was also a classmate of Benito Mussolini. This is August Giuliani. So, any relation to the other Giuliani? brother from another mother, you'd be the judge. Sexual misconduct by clergy is an issue then. Giuliani will testify in court that he was not driven out of the Catholic Church because of rape, and he was later accused of sexual misconduct in his Milwaukee congregation. And Giuliani uh, meets an American missionary. She's a Methodist Protestant who's trying to convert Catholics, and they establish a church in the Third Ward, and they try to convert the Italians there to be Protestants, to uh, learn to assimilate, learn English, convert to Protestantism, and support World War I. This is Giuliani's church. That's him standing on the left with his arms folded and the woman on the right uh, in black with the glasses. That, I believe, is his wife, Catherine Eyrick. So Congress declares World War I in April of 1917. Anarchists and socialists oppose this. 
Now, street corner preaching is actually quite common in those days. And Giuliani decides he'll do this in Bayview at the corner of Potter and Bishop, which is now Wentworth. This is one block north of the Anarchist Clubhouse in what is now the Cactus Club. Members of the Anarchist Club come out of their uh, clubhouse and they heckle and threaten Giuliani and he and his group leave. They come back the next uh, uh, Sunday and once again, the same thing happens and Giuliani vows to return. And Giuliani keeps his promise. Giuliani comes back again on Sunday, September 9th, and this time he has four Milwaukee police plainclothes detectives. Giuliani's group begins their meeting on the northwest corner of the intersection. The Italian anarchists uh, march north from their clubhouse, and they will encounter the MPD detectives on the northeast corner. Once again, the anarchists begin harassing and trying to disrupt Giuliani's meeting. Uh, let me see if I can get the uh, laser pointer to function here. Here we go. The, the meeting occurs right here uh, at this intersection. This is the corner of Potter and Wentworth in 1917, and this is the corner of it today. Giuliani's group is here on the northwest corner in front of this uh, striped structure. This is the northeast corner. This is where the MPD detectives are. The Cactus Club is behind us and to our right a block south down here, uh, and so they will come up and meet the MPD detectives right here. This time people die. The detective tells one of the anarchists to move along and tries to frisk him. Uh, a gun battle breaks out. Two of the detectives are wounded. One anarchist is killed. One will die later of his wounds and two others are wounded along with a bystander. MPD's response, round up the usual suspects. Uh, they launch a dragnet. They raid the clubhouse. They arrest 11 people. They arrest another 46 over the next three days. And the problem is the suspects don't speak English and nobody on the police force speaks Italian. Uh, headlines in the papers proudly announced that MPD uses the third degree. And eventually, uh, 12 of them will be charged with conspiracy to commit first degree murder by Assistant District Attorney Winfred Zabel. One of them will die of his wounds, so the remaining 11 defendants were set for trial. As his interpreter, Zabel chose August Giuliani, because apparently no one ever heard of conflict of interest. Zabel chose Giuliani to interpret for the 11 suspects. Uh, he's, in fact, the intended victim of the September 9th riot. The suspects had only their chief accuser to express themselves through, and seven of the suspects later dis disputed much of what Giuliani said they said. This is District Attorney Winfred Zabel. He is a socialist. Giuliani leaves town on November 24th, 1917. He leaves his church in charge of his assistant, Maud Richter, and around 8 a.m., the cleaning lady, Erminia Spicchiati, and her 10-year-old daughter, Josie, arrive to start cleaning. This is Giuliani's church in the 1950s. And this is the location of Giuliani's church. Uh, this is it right here. Uh, and this struck, this thing here, this line is a fence and that will be important in a couple of minutes. Um, and so the site is across the street from the Westin Hotel downtown, right about here, right about where this uh, driveway is. This is 535 North Van Buren. And the bomb is found. 10.30 a.m., Josie looks out the window and she sees this package between the church's south wall and the fence I just indicated. At 11 a.m., Erminia looks at it. She recognizes it as a bomb and does absolutely nothing. She finishes her chores and goes home. At 3 p.m., she notifies his Maud Richter at another Giuliani facility. That's Erminia and Josie on the left, and that's Maud Richter on the right. Uh, at 4 p.m., the bomb has now been there for about six hours. She returns to the church and finds the package. She believes it to be a bomb. It's too heavy for her to lift, so she lugs it to the basement, banging it on the steps along the way, and she takes it apart. Uh, she looks inside, and then she carefully reassembles the bomb because, as she would later explain, I wanted to show the police how it worked. She sees a vial uh, containing a brown fluid, and in the hole she looks into, there's a yellow substance like powder. Finally, at 5.20, the bomb has now been there for seven hours. She makes a phone call to the police. There was some dispute. She claimed she made the call. The cops claimed they never got it. Uh, nothing happened. So at 7.20, she decides to send church handyman Sam Mazzoni to the police station with the package. And he takes it to the police station, which is about seven blocks away. Uh, at times, he puts the bomb on the ground and sat on it to rest. And he also, quote, dumped it on the sidewalk twice. 
Um, Mazzoni said he was alone, but he may have been accompanied by John Anello, Giuliani church member and founder of Milwaukee's Florentine Opera. You'll note that the headline that I showed you in the first slide said the bomb was found by two Italian boys. Well, this is where the church and station are in relation to each other. However, the station is shown as being on the southeast corner of the intersection in question, which is now Broadway and Wells. And uh, this uh, map indicates that, in fact, it's on the northeast corner. It's on the same block with St. Mary's Church uh, and an armory. And so if we look at this photograph, uh, the building furthest to the right, right here, this building is the police station. This is the armory. And here we have the distinctive spire of St. Mary's Church. And if we go there today, what do we see? Here's the spire of St. Mary's Church. And here is this parking structure on the site of the police station. There is, in fact, a bank on the site of the station. And in fact, the entrance to the police station is about where the entrance to the bank is now. And so Mazzoni delivers the bomb. Just before 7.30, he walks in and says, this is a bomb I found it under the church. Um, he is uh, dragged into another room to do some interpreting. Desk Sergeant Henry Deckard picks the bomb up, takes it into the office of Lieutenant Robert Flood, and says, look at the new kind of bomb I've got. Uh, Flood says, get that thing out of here. Don't fool around with anything like that. Well, unfortunately, Deckard thinks probably to himself, well, where exactly am I going to go with it? What am I going to do with it? Uh, whatever his reasons, he takes it across the hall to the south side of the station, on the Well Street side, and carries it into the squad room, also known as the assembly room. This is a floor plan of the police station. Uh, Mazzoni would have entered here. We would walk down this corridor to this structure, which is Deckard's uh, desk. Uh, this uh, structure here is the assembly room, the room marked HA. And then there's this office space here. Uh, and then over here, you have the cell blocks. So this would be the space marked office. This is the assembly room. And then these are the cell blocks. Uh, the office would have been in the foreground around here, and the assembly room would be in the back on this patio area uh, on the south side of this bank. So he then summons the detectives. Six of them enter the assembly room. Deckard is close to a big table in the room, and it seems he had the bomb between his legs as he's unwrapping the paper with both hands. Uh, it's anywhere from 20 to 40 pounds. It's about the size of a half-gallon jar. There's a small bottle filled with an unknown brown liquid uh, on top. Uh, that will burn a hole in Mazzoni's coat. And then Catherine Walker, a woman who entered the police station to file a complaint about an ex-boyfriend, enters the room. She had observed a policeman she knew enter the station, and she didn't want to uh, disclose the embarrassing situation with her boyfriend, so she ducks into the squad room to avoid him. Bomb is examined. Uh, Flood goes back to his office. Three to six minutes or more, give or take, have passed. Detective Bergen is in the corridor, and Detective Lewis Hartman is descending the stairs, and the bomb explodes at 7.33 p.m. With a blinding flash, every window is blown out. Uh, the lights go out. It's pitch dark in the station. Uh, people in the station felt it more than heard it due to the huge pressure wave. And the bomb explodes here. This is where the assembly room would have been on this patio area. The blast is powerful, uh, it rocks the neighborhood, it's heard miles away, and a slug travels a full city block, punched through a bedroom window, and cuts through an iron bedpost. Glass, plastering, clothing, arms, legs, papers cover the floor. Uh, from the ceiling swung loosened planks and the two blackened chandeliers. This is the assembly room after the blast. I believe these white stuff here is plaster that wasn't blown off the walls. Uh, all this other stuff is the exposed lath underneath. And this is a uh, the hole in the assembly room floor made by the blast. This is the hole here. You can see it's about deep enough to cover this entire blade of the shovel. Fred Kaiser's watch tells the time he died. It stopped at 7.33. Um, he was 39, married three kids, and was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. Uh, this is Fred Kaiser. He was age 39 when he died. David O'Brien dies. He is uh, has 20 years of service. He's found face down, partially covered with debris, and dozens of his friends have to view the body before an identification can be made. This is David J. O'Brien. He was 52 years old. 
His wedding ring is found, but it's all twisted and broken, but it does have his initials on it. Four people get out. Spindler, Stecker, Sehar, and Walker make it out, only half dead, partly because Detective Stout and Lieutenant Flood uh, apparently give them first aid. They are rushed to emergency hospital by ambulance. This is Charles Sehar. He's age 45. He and Detective Stecker start together on the police force on the same day, and they are wounded, uh, standing next to each other. Um, Stecker lands near the doorway. His arms and limbs were crushed to pulp, and his body was mangled frightfully. And they die together. They both arrive at the emergency hospital at 8.30. Stecker is declared dead at 8.40, and Sehar is declared dead at 8.45. This is Stefan Stecker. He was 36. He left a wife and son. Arm operator Edward Spindler is working at the switchboard on the second floor. He's killed at his desk when a piece of shrapnel blasts through the floor and into his body. He's talking on the phone with another detective who hears a dull roar. Spindler said, we just had a little explosion here, and the line goes dead. Uh, Spindler dies in the ambulance on the way to emergency hospital. This is Edward Spindler. He was 38. And Catherine Walker dies. Uh, she was... Uh, uh, beyond human aid, she lay among most of the corpses, which were piled in crushed heaps on the floor. She died in the ambulance on the way to emergency hospital. This is Catherine Walker. And then two officers from the September 9th Bayview incident are killed, Albert Templin and Paul Weiler. Weiler was the officer who tried to search the anarchist. The bomb is so powerful that his revolver uh, is twisted out of shape and its barrel is blown off. Uh, Templin also had been shot that day with a minor wound. He was mourning the deaths of two young children. This is Detective Albert Templin. This is Detective Paul Weiler. And also plainclothesman Frank Haswin died. He was 29. He left a wife and son. Sergeant Henry Deckert uh, was holding it between his legs, is blown to pieces, literally. Most of his remains are described as teaspoon size. Only one leg in uniform pants was recognizable. That leads them to believe there's an 11th person. Uh, again, the headline I showed you on the first slide originally said that 11 people had died. This is Sergeant Henry Deckard. He was 10, he was 29. Uh, Bergen and Hartman are both wounded. Hartman gets a projectile uh, in the upper arm, and Bergen is wounded through both calves. This is Lewis Hartman on the left and Bergen on the right. So these are the dead being removed. Uh, basically, the CSI indicates that the vial in the bomb held sulfuric acid, which dripped onto a zinc plate. That generates heat. It ignites either cotton or black powder, and the bomb is packed with various metal objects to act as shrapnel. This is a diagram of the bomb. You can see here, this is the vial of sulfuric acid on the top. It's basically a pipe with two plates across it. The plates are held together at the corners by bolts and uh, uh, nuts. And when it drops onto the sink plate, that causes heat, which in turn detonates gunpowder, which in turn detonates the dynamite here. When he says cotton, he probably means gun cotton. Highly flammable nitrocellulose products are often referred to as gun cotton. Uh, it's around six times more powerful than an equal volume of black powder. This is a picture of gun cotton. It looks just like cotton. Is this the yellow powder that Maud Richter saw? And the bomb is sophisticated. The acid dripping acts as a time control as perfect as a clock mechanism as long as the bomb was not moved. Uh, the jolting the bomb received advanced the time of the explosion by increasing the flow of acid. Uh, the bomb was set to detonate around 8 a.m. Sunday during the church service. This is O'Brien's funeral. And this is his grandson with his badge. So the officers are remembered at the uh, Milwaukee Police Academy and at the police memorial on the north side of the police administration building downtown. So, MPD's response, round up the usual suspects, part two, the sequel. Uh, basically, after the dead and dying had been carried out, the first order of business was to round up Italians. Uh, 44 people are arrested, but in fact, the crime is never solved. Uh, here we have the deceased and the charged. On the right, we have the officers we've discussed, and on the left, we have the Bayview 11, the anarchists. I'm not going to go into their personal history too much. Uh, these are pictures of the Bayview 11. Uh, the woman in the middle is Maria Nardini, uh, and she was thought to be the ringleader. And as, we did, as if we didn't have enough tragedy, now the lawyers get involved. 
The trial for conspiracy to commit first degree murder begins on November 30th, six days after the bombing before Judge August Backus. Giuliani is again the interpreter for both the defendants and any documents. Uh, people feel that the trial was marked by misconduct by both Zabel and Backus, and many of the defendants were found guilty due to prejudice from the November 24th bombing. We know they didn't do the bombing. They were in jail at the time. Uh, this is Judge August C. Backus. I was once at a, at a dinner for an organization, and I was talking to the man next to me and discovered he was, in fact, Judge Backus's grandson. And his grandson, Carl Backus, explains his grandfather's decision. German Americans were looked upon with suspicion uh, after we entered World War I. More than 4,000 of them, one of them, my grandfather, were in prison. And uh, Judge Backus had to be careful uh, of being accused of being un-American. The trial is not exactly the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Zabel calls Reuben a contemptible pup. Uh, Reuben threatens to punch Zabel in the nose. Zabel says, I object to this cheap comedy. And Reuben says, I object to this cheap criticism from this chief district attorney. Uh, Reuben tries to show that the attack on Giuliani was based on insults to the Catholic Church, supposedly spoken by Giuliani. Uh, Reuben tries to show that the anarchists were defending the honor of the Catholic Church. However, the defendants admit on the stand that they did not believe in the same church that they were supposedly defending. Justice is swift after a three-week trial. The jury spends less than 90 seconds considering the guilt of each defendant. All 11 were sentenced to 25 years in prison. And then after the trial, there's an attempt to harm Assistant District Attorney Frederick Growell, who had been Zabel's assistant at the trial. Uh, some women in his family are returning their house in their car, and as they approach their garage, a man comes out of the darkness and points a pistol at the seat where Growell usually sat. The women scream, and they crash into the garage, and the man runs away. This is Growell's house today, 2425 West Kilburn Avenue, and you can see the garage in the back. So there's an attempt to kill Zabel. A uh, 17 year old anarchist named Ella Antolini picks up 36 sticks of dynamite in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, Pullman Porter peeks into her satchel and sees the dynamite, and she's arrested in Chicago. This is Gabriella Antolini, the dynamite girl. Uh, Ella gets 18 months in prison. She won't talk, but she does leave a clue. She sends a letter to Youngstown that's intercepted by the FBI, and Special Agent Rain Weston Finch arrest several suspects who are determined to be galleonists. Uh, Emma, Ella will share a prison cell with Emma Goldman, and she learns to sew in prison. Uh, the FBI, at that time, is known as the Bureau of Investigation. It determines a man named Mario Ruska had given Ella the dynamite, and a well-dressed man named Carlo Lodi had summoned her to Youngstown at a one-night stand with her and then put her on the train to Chicago. As a result, the FBI raids the Cronaca Subversiva office in Lynn, Massachusetts. They find letters written from Mexico by Carlo Lodi and another man using the alias Nasos, which means big nose. Nasos is the man who intends to plant Ella's dynamite. Uh, a September 1917 letter before the, uh, uh, the, the bombing in Milwaukee uh, states that uh, Nasos is going to plant the poof, which was apparently slang for bomb. And then there's another attempt to kill Sable. A neighbor finds two unexploded bombs outside his house, one on each side. One of the bombs was a duplicate of the one that destroyed the police station. This is Abel's house today, 2159 North Sherman Boulevard. So the bombs are put in a uh, tub of water in a vacant lot for 72 hours, and then they are the bomb is disassembled. And basically, it's the same thing. It's a steel cylinder with six inch plates on either end attached by four long bolts. You have layers of soft dynamite, which I believe means gun cotton, uh, alternated with various shrapnel objects, as well as 132 caliber bullets uh, and a vial of sulfuric acid on top of the device. So Emma Goldman and other anarchists raise money. They hire Clarence Darrow, the most famous lawyer in America, to appeal the Bayview 11 verdicts. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court finds that uh, there's no evidence to convict two of the defendants of anything. Five others could only have been guilty of a misdemeanor. Uh, two of the remaining four are not guilty of conspiracy. And finally, only two who had displayed weapons, uh, their convictions are allowed to stand. Enter attorney Dean Strang with his most famous client, Stephen Avery. Uh, in 1922, while running for elections, Zabel is accused of graft and corruption. He asked for a special grand jury, and one of the witnesses' question was, 
uh, Frederick Grohl, who had been his assistant during the Bayview 11 trial. And now we know why they stopped trying to kill the DAs. Grohl testifies that he and Zabel go to Chicago. They ask Darrow to intercede with the Chicago anarchists and persuade them to call off the attempts on their life. In exchange, the DAs promised to alter the trial record in such a way that the 11 would be found not guilty on appeal. Darrow tells them, you can go home and rest in peace. There won't be any further trouble. Even though it appears they didn't actually do that, there's little or no support for the conclusion that Zabel and Grohl fixed the appeal, altering the record multiple times would have been so massive a task and so unlikely to work that it seems unlikely. Basically, I think uh, Zabel and Grohl realized this case would not stand up on appeal. So they told Darrow they would do something they didn't really need to do, uh, and the case would be dismissed anyway. Uh, as a result of this, Congress passes the Immigration Act of 1918. This broadens the definition of anarchism uh, considerably. And as a result, the Bayview 11 are deported. Once they're released from prison, they will be uh, deported back to Italy. Three of them will sneak back into the United States in 1925 through Canada and remain in the U.S. for the rest of their life. Ella Antolini will not be deported. They couldn't prove she was an anarchist. She will die in New York in 1983. Remember the part where she learned how to sew in prison with Emma Goldman? Ella works for a high-end bridal shop on the East Coast, and she is one of 30 women who sew Princess Grace's 1956 wedding gown. Because global pandemic is a problem then too, while this is happening, they're also dealing with the 1918 flu pandemic. It infected 500 million people, about a third of the world's population, and the death toll is estimated to have been somewhere between 17 million and 50 million people. Does this look familiar? Yeah, yes, it does look familiar. And the 1918 virus may have come from China as well. Leading experts says that it uh, came from China, mutated in the United States, and they're spread to Europe and the rest of the world with allied soldiers and sailors as the main disseminators. 96,000 Chinese laborers who were recruited to work behind allied lines might have been the source of the pandemic. Hopefully it won't get, our current pandemic won't get as bad as this. 17 million people died in India. 22% of the population of Western Samoa perished. And in America, we lost somewhere between a half a million and 675,000 people. Because then, as now, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Well, in April 1919, someone tries to kill prominent Americans with a booby-trapped dynamite-filled mail bombs. These bombs are intended to be uh, delivered and exploded on May 1st, the International Day of Leftist Revolutionary Solidarity. One bomb does injure two people who open it. Does that sound familiar? Just a couple of years ago, somebody sent a bunch of mail bombs to prominent Americans. Uh, the bombs are described, they're in a brown paper uh, with a, block, a stick of dynamite and a block of wood and a small vial of sulfuric acid. Where have we seen that before? When you open the end of the box marked open, uh, that causes the acid to drip onto the blasting cap, which in turn detonates the dynamite. The people who send these bombs are both uh, extremely dangerous and completely inept. Uh, only one of the bombs is mistakenly delivered all the other bombs end up in the dead letter office because they didn't put enough postage on it. These are the intended victims. They're very prominent people. I'll just read some of their titles. Governor, uh, postmaster, congressman, commissioner of immigration, police commissioner, district attorney, uh, Rain Weston Finch, again, the mayor of Seattle, former senator, Supreme Court justice, commissioner of immigration, uh, mayor of New York City, U.S. Congressman, U.S. Senator, U.S. District Judge, J.P. Morgan Jr., um, another Senator, the Attorney General of the United States, John D. Rockefeller, uh, another U.S. Senator, the Governor of Pennsylvania, and the Secretary of Labor. These are highly prominent Americans, all of whom have done something to alienate and offend the American left. But one of these names proves who sent the bomb, and that's Bureau of Investigation Agent Rain Weston Finch. He has specifically ticked off the Galleanist because he's the guy who leads the raid on the Kronaka Subversiva office in uh, Lynn, Massachusetts. Well, if at first you don't succeed, use a bigger bomb. Nine bombs detonate nearly simultaneously in eight U.S. cities at the home of government officials who have alienated the left. Again, they're uh, all wrapped or packaged with heavy metal slugs. Uh, a watchman is killed. This is a list of those targeted. Uh, 
a church, an industrialist, the mayor of Cleveland, a Boston judge, a federal judge, immigration chief, uh, another judge, and the attorney general of the United States again, A. Mitchell Palmer. This is Alexander Mitchell Palmer. He is the U.S. Attorney General. Um, and at 11.15 p.m. on June 2nd, 1919, he and his wife are preparing for bed. There's a thump at the door followed by a tremendous explosion. Uh, the front of the house is blown away and uh, he and his family narrowly escaped death. This is Palmer's house after the bomb. And this is when history almost changed because Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt live across the street from Palmer and they're walking to their house just moments before the explosion. If they had been another 10 or 20 seconds earlier, they probably would have been killed. Um, this is Franklin and Eleanor in the 1920s. Imagine Eleanor, uh, American history without the Roosevelts. Well, their idea of an expert witness in 1919 is a French hairdresser. The bomber's scalp is on the roof of FDR's house. So they take it to the French hairdresser. He looks at it uh, and he concludes that the man uh, was Italian and 26 to 28 years of age, which will prove to be completely accurate. Uh, the police put the pieces together, literally. Uh, he's a tall young man. Uh, he had traveled, he's very well dressed, and he had traveled from uh, New York to D.C. through Philadelphia, arriving about an hour be in D.C. before the bomb exploded. So the Palmer bombing is shown in the movie J. Edgar, starring uh, Leonardo DiCaprio as J. Edgar Hoover. Well, Galliani, by uh, coincidence, is deported, not because he can be linked to the bombings, but because he is a resident alien who advocates the violent overthrow of the government. Race riots were a problem then. This is the red summer of 1919. So it's a period just like today, they got global pandemic and riots in the streets. Uh, white men who are sent to France to fight World War I come back to find that uh, African-Americans have been recruited to take their jobs for lower wages. Uh, industrialists also use black people as strike breakers and this increases resentment. Uh, riot sweep Chicago. Does this sound familiar? Yep, riot sweep Chicago. Because then, as now, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But at least no one today has tried to hang the mayor. So the Bureau of Investigation, which is what the FBI is called at that time, swings into action, and it's really not up to the task. Uh, it's very small. Uh, it is distrusted by other agencies. It lacks consistent support from Congress, and most Americans don't even know it exists. Uh, most people confuse it with the Secret Service. That's because they're not actually law enforcement officers. They are the federal government's private detective agency. They don't have arrest powers. Uh, they have to get somebody else to make the arrest. They're not authorized to carry firearms. They do not own automobiles. They have to take public transportation to do their investigations uh, and their political patronage appointments. These are Bureau of Investigation uh, credentials, the badge and ID card. Uh, it grows rapidly from 24 operatives to its height of uh, 1,000, and then other federal agencies also will contribute uh, agents to this investigation. William Flynn is made BOI director because he's the greatest expert in anarchist circles of the United States. Uh, and he is particularly interested in the followers of Luigi Galliani, Subversive Chronicle. This is William Flynn, he's director of the VOI. And J. Edgar Hoover is promoted. He's a young, ambitious clerk. He's made special assistant to the attorney general. He's in complete charge of planning the attack on radicalism during the summer and fall of 1919. Uh, this is John Edgar Hoover, and he is, by the standards of the day, a progressive. Leaflets were delivered with these bombs. They tie them all together. Uh, the leaflets read in part, there will have to be bloodshed, there will have to be murder, we will kill. Uh, we will rid the world of your tyrannical institutions. This is the plain words leaflet. Leaflets are traced to a print shop employing Andrea Salcido and Roberto Elia. They are both anarchists. They are arrested. They are kept in the BOI offices in New York City for eight weeks. They both admit to printing the leaflets and giving them to an anarchist named Nicola Recci. This is Nicola Recci, but somebody else must have written them because the Recci is illiterate. Salcido dies in police custody. Uh, he falls, jumps, or pushes, is pushed out of the 14th floor Bureau of Investigation offices. Uh, it's unclear who did it, but most likely he either committed suicide or was pushed out the window by Roberto Elia. This is Andrea Salcido. Palmer's response to the bombing of his house, round up the usual suspects, the trilogy. The trilogy. 
Palmer launches the Palmer Raids. Um, in the late 1919 and early 1920s, somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 people are detained. Notice the spread. Uh, they don't really know how many people they were. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> They don't even know how many people were rounded up. And many of them were American citizens who had nothing to do with anarchism. Uh, these are Palmer Raid headlines. And the detained immigrants are kept in controversial conditions. Some are kept on an island in Boston Harbor in January with no heat, blanket, or mattresses. One guy kills himself, one goes mad, and others die of pneumonia. Uh, these are the Palmer Raids uh, taking place. Things were really bad in Detroit. 800 people are kept on the fifth floor uh corridor of the federal building there's no food beds or washing facilities and only one toilet and the prisoners are held incommunicado does that sound familiar uh palmer believes that if you deport enough people you will eventually deport the right ones uh they can't find or identify these people and if they do they'll have to have a criminal trial before a jury but in this case bureaucrats make the deportation decisions and their decisions are final However, deportation orders had to be signed by the Secretary of Labor, Lewis Post, who refuses to deport anyone without evidence of leftist activities. These are Palmer Ray detainees awaiting deportation at Ellis Island. Because impeachment is an issue then as well, uh, Post is threatened with impeachment. He testifies before Congress. He sort of turns all public opinion around. Public had supported the uh, raids uh, and Post's testimony changes that. Palmer also testifies but eventually people applaud Post and Palmer's largely blamed for the bad aspects of the raids. This is Secretary of Labor, Lewis Post. Well, our friend Emma Goldman, we say goodbye to her. Uh, she and her lover are deported to Russia. Aboard this ship, the U.S. Army Transport Buford, which is the ship used in the Buster Keaton classic silent movie, The Navigator. The ACLU was formed January 19th, 1920 as a response to the Palmer raids um it documents government abuses um and it, the abuses are also condemned by other prominent lawyers and palmer who was once seen as a likely presidential candidate loses his bid for the democratic nomination for president because palmer like the other giuliani runs for potus president of the united states on an anti-terrorism platform well joe mccarthy's red scare was actually the second red scare this and other events lead to the first red scare um its immediate cause was the increase in subversive actions of foreign and leftist elements especially militant followers of luigi galliani at its height in 1919-1920 uh concerns over the effects of radical political agitation fuel a general sense of concern in america meantime massachusetts police are investigating a robbery homicide uh, in a payroll at a shoe company in braintree massachusetts Two men are killed by two robbers who steal the payroll and escape. These two men, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, are arrested for the crime. Who are Sacco and Vanzetti? They're Italian-born American arsonists who will be convicted of this crime and executed. They are the center of one of the largest cause celebres in American history. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti is the OJ case of its day, only it goes on for seven years. And Sacco and Vanzetti have an an accomplice named Mike Boda, who escapes, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti are charged with murder and indicted on September 14th, 1920. Wall Street explodes two days later, September 16th at 12.01 p.m. As the bells at Trinity Church are still tolling the noon bell, there's a huge blast. Uh, people are blown off their feet. feet. Uh, the fire burns through the lunch crowd. Headline sums it up crash out of blue sky, death comes, Wall Street is turned in shambles. Blast occurs here on Wall Street at Broad Street. So let's go there. Uh, we are standing at the intersection of Wall and Broad. Uh, Broad is to the right. To the left is Wall Street, and the building in front of us is the Morgan Bank. Uh, we go down Wall Street to this, the bomb site, 30 Wall Street. Bomb would be placed in the street right in front of this. And who owns the building next door? Donald Trump. Well, this is the Wall Street uh, after the explosion. It's the crime scene from hell. Casualties are horrendous. Uh, the devastation reminded them of a battlefield. In front of a cigar store, a clerk sliced at three men with his knife, trying to cut away their burning clothing. This is the cigar store. 
The bomb kills the people it is meant to liberate. No capitalists are killed. The working class is killed. 40 people are dead and 143 seriously wounded. The Wall Street bombing is the worst terrorist bombing until Oklahoma City in 1995. One man narrowly escapes death. He comes out of the subway and the concussion knocks him down. He gets up and he runs to Wall Street where he sees people running around with the blood streaming down their faces and broken glass fell like hail on bankers and brokers. He was almost killed. Like the Roosevelt's, if it had been a few seconds earlier, he probably would have died. And that man is Joseph P. Kennedy, the patriarch of the Kennedy family. Uh, that's him sitting in the uh, middle there. He's got Ted Kennedy on his lap and John Kennedy is standing behind him. Imagine American history without the Kennedys. This is the crime scene looking west. Note the disturbed pavement uh, and the reins of the wagon, which you can see right here. This, this right here is actually the remains of the wagon that carried the bomb. So it's time for CSI 1920 style. Detectives gather clues. Some clues are obvious. There's a wrecked car on Wall Street that's on, blown on its side and it's on fire. By the end of the day, the owner is located and determined not to be involved. This is the car in question, and this is the Morgan Bank building in the background. Some clues are smaller, hundreds of small curved pieces of metal that have flown as high as 38 stories and as far as five blocks away. They recover about 150 pounds of these two inch by six inch iron slugs, which were put in the bomb to act as shrapnel. But what are they? There are window sash weights that are used inside a double hung window. Well, the scars from these window sash weights are still visible today uh, on the Morgan Bank building. Here's some pictures of them. These are slug impact craters. Just how big is it? It's about this big. It's about the size of your hand. And the New York Police Department recovers the wagon. It's been thoroughly destroyed. That leads to the conclusion that it's uh, the source of the blast. This is a picture of it uh, as it was recovered. And in 1993 at the World Trade Center truck bombing, uh, the FBI is able to reconstruct the van. And in 1919, they reconstruct the wagon, sorry, 1920, which was never traced. Flynn comes to New York, he takes charge, he believes the Galeanists are responsible, he believes it's the same people who did the June 2nd bombings, and that it's revenge for the prosecution of Sacco and Benzetti. Uh, flyers are found in a mailbox of three minutes before the explosion, uh, they're recovered by a mailman, and he gives them to Flynn. This is what the flyers look like. Remember, we will not tolerate any longer American anarchist fighters. Uh, and these leaflets tie the Wall Street bombing to the June 2nd bombings. Uh, bombers had used a nearly identical signature, the anarchist fighters. Uh, at least two people composed them. They are printed with stamps. They're not printed in a print shop. And the driver must have abandoned the wagon, set the timing device, and then walked to the mailbox. 1993, the FBI has a piece of the World Trade Center uh, truck bomb. In 1919, they have pieces of the horse. In 1919, they also have the horseshoes. Now it's time for some horseshoe CSI. The shoes bear the certain marks that indicated that the horse had been shooed shortly before the blast. Posters describing the shoes are sent uh, out. And here we have on the left a copy of the poster. And then on the right, you can see on the right-hand side of this uh, horseshoe, the marks JIU and NOA. And eventually, the NPD will find the farrier. Uh, he remembers that around noon the day before the explosion, a man had driven a horse and wagon uh, into a shop and had a new pair of shoes nailed to the hooves. He could only vaguely remember the man. So the BOI shows him a few photos, more than 3,000 of them over two weeks. He picks out five, which he said resembled the driver, and from that a composite photo is made. He describes the man as Italian, five foot six, medium build, uh, wore a golf cap and a khaki shirt. This is a drawing of the Wall Street bomber. The case is never solved. Wall Street bombing remains a mystery. Well, at this point, until 1921, the president of the United States is Woodrow Wilson. He's a liberal progressive Democrat who'd been a lawyer and professor. Um, he was one of the founders of the progressive movement. 
both liberal progressive Democrats who had been lawyers and professors. Wilson addresses income inequality by raising income taxes. He imposes a 1% tax on incomes above $3,000, which only affects 3% of the population. Eventually, the uh, top income tax rate will be raised to 15%. Because Wilson and all three of these people want to raise taxes on the rich. Wilson is replaced by Republican Warren Harding. He was a very popular president until after he died. A number of scandals have come forward, which um, reduce his reputation. Um, two of his cabinet members are tried for corruption, and one, Albert Fall, the Interior Secretary, will be the first cabinet secretary to go to prison for corruption. After his death, his mistress, Nan Britton, writes what is considered to be the first kiss and tell book. She said she'd been Harding's mistress. She names him as the father of her daughter, and one famous passage told of their having sex in a coat closet in the executive office of the White House. DNA testing has confirmed that the daughter is, in fact, Harding's daughter. So they're both Republicans accused of corruption and sexual misconduct. And Nan Britton was the Stormy Daniels of her day. Eventually, the FBI will return to Flynn's original conclusion that the explosion on Wall Street was the work of either Italian anarchists or Italian terrorists. So what do these all have in common, Jim? Who done it? Well, enter Professor Paul Averich. He's the leading historian on the history of the anarchist movement in this period. He is the son of anarchists. Um, he's an ally of them. He sought to challenge the portrayal of them as amoral and violent, and he has sympathy for their cause. And Averich will discover who's responsible for all of the crimes that we have just uh, discussed. Drum roll, please. This man, Mario Buddha, also known as Mike Boda, associate of Sacco and Vanzetti. Mario Risca, the guy who gives the dynamite to Ella Antolini. And Nassos, big nose, the guy who wrote the letters uh, seized in the Lynn, Massachusetts raid. Who is Mario Buda? Well, he's an Italian anarchist. Um, he immigrates to the United States in 1907, where he discovers that the roads aren't paved and he's expected to pave them. He goes back to Italy in 1911, then two years later returns to the United States. He's a small man, five foot two with a little mustache uh, and a large nose that earned him the name Nassos or Big Nose. Uh, he's a chronic uh, subversive contributor. Uh, he's a very quiet, serious man who rarely says anything. He's radicalized in America by Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, he attends an anarchist group of these two followers of Galliani and devotes his free time to the organization of free Italian anarchist schools where children are taught to be anarchists. He goes to Mexico with Sacco and Vanzetti. In 1917, about 50 or 60 anarchists uh, go to Mexico to avoid military service. These 50 or 60 men will become the hardcore of the Galleanist movement. And he returns from exile in Mexico to avenge the Bayview 11. Over the next few weeks, during October and November, plans were laid to avenge the death of their comrades in Milwaukee. According to Average, Buddha and his accomplice plant the Milwaukee bomb. More likely, however, Buddha himself was responsible, along with Carlo Valdinocci. Who's Carlo Valdinocci? Well, he's an anarchist uh, from Italy as well. Uh, he's cheerful and outgoing. He's blessed with striking good looks. Everyone notices his hair, thick, dark, wavy, and combed in the pompadour style. Where have we seen this before? He's also a stylish dresser. And this is Carlo Valdinocci. And Buddha and Valdinocci reti retaliate for the trial of the baby of 11. Um, at the end of December, after sentence was passed, Buddha, Valdinocci, and their associates hatched a new scheme of retaliation. Uh, they work out a uh, plan uh, of revenge against the Milwaukee prosecutor. It's Buddha and Valdinocci who give the dynamite to Ella Antolini. Uh, Valdinocci summons her to Youngstown, and Buddha gives her the dynamite, and then Valdinocci puts her on the train. And it's Valdinocci who tries to blow up D.A. Sable's house. Uh, there's a deportation warrant out for him, but he could not be found. Uh, he makes good his escape in West Virginia from Rain Weston Finch, who's chasing him. He doubles back to Milwaukee and plants the bombs at Zabel's house and then returns to Massachusetts. The Gallianists do the 1919 mail bombs. Uh, the physical preparations were left to Valdinocci and Buddha. They chose their victims with utmost care. Uh, Buddha, Valdinocci, Sacco, Vanzetti, and Nicola Recci do the 1919 bombs. Uh, the members, 40 to 50 strong, again, 
The guys who'd gone to Mexico included Sacco, Vanzetti, and so on. Apart from Buda and Valdenoci, the most important participant was Nicola Recci, who had lost his left hand while making bombs. Uh, this is Nicola Recci in later life. Note his missing left hand. Uh, Valdenoci and Buda distribute the bombs for the June 2nd house bombings uh, by uh, traveling through the country and leaving them with anarchist comrades. Uh, Valdenoci leaves Boston and travels south, and most likely Buddha went west on a similar mission. He carried bombs and a supply of plain words, leaflets. Uh, Judge Landis is the most likely target. He had also been the target of one of the mail bombs. Uh, this is Kennesaw Mountain Landis. He's the guy who sentenced Ella Antolini to prison, and he's also the first commissioner of baseball. Valdenoci is not arrested because he's dead. He's the guy who blows himself up on Palmer's front porch. Uh, he tells a friend he's going to uh, D.C., and he's never heard from again. And there's other evidence to indicate that he is the bomber. Because one of the beliefs of the American left for many years is that, is that Sacco and Vanzetti were completely innocent Italian workingmen selected at random. Uh, but according to Averich, no. They, that they were involved in the 1919 bombings is a virtual certainty. Both were ultra-militants, believed in armed revolution. They carried guns. They had gone to Mexico. They were known associates of the plot participants. And according to anarchist Charles Poggi, Buddha and Sacco did the Braintree holdup. Those who think that Sacco and Vanzetti are either innocent or guilty are basically both half right. Sacco and Vault was there, according to Buddha, apparently Vanzetti was not. Uh, I had a strong feeling that Buddha was one of the robbers. Money, we used to go and get it where it was. Buddha narrowly avoids arrest with Sacco and Vanzetti. He's eating his breakfast when the police pull up and he slips out the back door. Uh, he stays underground for a number of months and then he returns to Boston after he reads about the arrest of Sacco and Vanzetti. Buddha did Wall Street. He tells his nephew Frank Maffi and Charles Poggi, who interviewed him in Italy in 1955, that he's the guy who planted the bomb on Wall Street. He said he remained at the scene of the bombing. He's neither arrested nor questioned, and his name does not appear in any government files or reports on the bombing. And he gets away with it. He planted the poof. Uh, his final act of reprisal, the biggest of them all, had gone off without a hitch. Goes back to Italy, never to return to the United States. This is a Wall Street bombing suspect police sketch compared to uh, Buddha. What I call this is a Bruder film of New York. Is that Buddha or the bombing suspect on the far right? Guy's wearing a golf shirt and a khaki, uh, khaki shirt rather, and a golf cap. He looks just like the guy in the uh, sketch. Where's that Buddha on the left walking directly at the camera? That guy's got a big nose, and that does look a lot like Buddha because there may have been two bombers. Um, the stamps which made the leaflets were purchased by two men. The leaflets were composed by two men, and some of the witnesses said they saw two men driving the bomb wagon. Well, Giuliani will have his revenge. His classmate Benito Mussolini comes to power in 1922. And if Buddha thought he had problems in the U.S., he's sentenced to five years in prison. After he gets out, he pretty much drops out of anarchist behavior at all and spends the rest of his life as a shoemaker. These bombings and other acts of terror and labor unrest are partially responsible for restrictions on immigration from countries thought likely to produce terrorists, which in those days are the countries from Southern and Eastern Europe where anarchism was thought to be common. Does that sound familiar? Because great minds think alike. When young British Muslims uh, read the words of anarchists put on trial a century ago, they show an exhilarated recognition. They identify with the anarchist bombers and because they're brothers from another mother. And they act out of revenge. Eventually, the anarchist texts cease. Uh, their indiscriminate attacks on ordinary people discredit them in the eyes of the wider public uh, and because their grievances go away. Trade unions are legalized, the eight-hour workday, greater safety protection, and because the Gallienists are attrited. Nine of them, including Valdenoce, will die from their own bombs. Nine, including Galliani, are deported. Sacco and Vincetti are executed. Recce and Buddha leave the USA, as do many others. And I'm sure the Palmer raids probably scooped up some of them as well. So out of 50 hardcore Gallianists, about half of them are gone. Well, as America's greatest philosopher explains, it's like deja vu all over again. Because we may be approaching the same tipping point. The maximum number of uh, immigrants as a percentage of the population in America were in 1910. 
and 14.7%. And we are now at about 14.4% of the population. And there may be something about that 14 to 15% that provokes a backlash, as we see today. Uh, this is the past and the future. Um, immigrants topped out at 14.7%, and now they're at about 14.2%. So history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. This hour is Buddha's legacy to mankind. His wagon is the first car bomb or vehicle borne improvised explosive device. Uh, modern use of an inconspicuous vehicle, anonymous in almost any urban setting, transport large quantities of high explosive into precise range of a high value target. Buddha's wagon is the first of all car bombs. So let's go back to the place where it all began, Milwaukee Police Memorial or Ceremony uh, at Broadway and Wells. But in reality, where it all began, began here in Bayview. You can make a movie about this, and someone did. It's called No Gods, No Masters. It's a 2012 American uh, suspense thriller. It basically covers much of the same material we've covered, Sacco and Vanzetti and the 1920 Wall Street bombing. Stars David Strathairn as William Flynn. These are the actors playing Hoover and Palmer. Covers the 1919 bombings. And was filmed in Milwaukee in 2009 over 24 days at 42 different locations. Uh, here it is being filmed. It's filmed at the Villa Terrace, which stands in for John D. Rockefeller's house, and at the South Shore Bathhouse. Wall Street explosion takes place at Water and Michigan. It is not particularly historically uh, accurate. Uh, it is available you know, on Amazon and YouTube. So this is the bibliography. These are two books about the bombing, the Milwaukee Police Station bomb and Worse Than the Devil by Dean Strang. Uh, Strang has an interview on the internet on Wisconsin PBS. The November 2017 issue of Milwaukee Magazine. Uh, the September 1932 issue of True Detective magazine, as well as Anarchy in Bayview's Little Italy by Anna Passante. Uh, this is a September 32 issue of True Detective. It's not completely accurate. And then Averich's books, Sacco and Vanzetti, The Anarchist Background, Anarchist Voices, Wall Street Bibliography, The Day Wall Street Exploded, and The Bombing of Wall Street, a PBS documentary. These two books are about the early history of the Bureau of Investigation and Hoover's involvement in this case. And then additional books I consulted, Sacco and Benzetti and Young Mr. Roosevelt. Uh, my previous lecture is uh, on this subject is on YouTube. Uh, Detective Templin's granddaughters attended. They told me that the family knew he died in the bomb blast, but they didn't know much about the case at all. And they were gratified to find out how, exactly how their grandfather died. So finally, the slide you've all been waiting for, it's over. It's finally over. This is the end. Any questions?